Hi, and welcome to my presentation, Myth Makers, a classical mythology class inspired by the maker movement. My name is Natalie Roy. I teach middle school students at Glasgow Middle School in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. If you need to reach me after this presentation to ask questions or make comments, my email address is there for you. But please follow me on Twitter at Magistra Roy for tips and tricks and fun stuff related to classical STEM. I often get asked about the classes that I teach. Um, there are two of them. Any student can take them. They are both one year in length and they serve as an elective choice for many different types of students. In Roman technology, we recreate the products and processes of the ancient Roman daily life using experimental archaeology. My Myth Makers class, we use ancient Greek and Roman myths uh, as inspiration for maker projects. And yes, of course, I teach Latin as well. But uh, in the past couple of years since I've been at Glasgow, these two classes have really taken off and have become the focus of my work. So many people ask me, especially Latin teachers, why is there no Latin in your classes? Uh, by design, my Roman technology and MythMaker classes do not require Latin or ancient Greek knowledge, and they don't focus on languages. And I have very strong beliefs about why that, that uh, I want my classes to be that way. So my vision for classical education is to broaden its scope a bit beyond language education, to study um, the products and processes of daily life. So I feel like much can be learned from experiential learning, utilizing when possible the actual tools of the ancient classical world. So, and I, as you probably know, uh, I feel Latin classes are oftentimes too full of content to include lengthy projects, which these two classes do. Um, classical mythology is a study that could use more depth since often only its basics are taught in Latin class. When you have time, you kind of throw it in there. Um, many middle school students and some high school students are looking for electives uh, that include STEM and STEAM to offer their students, since they are topics that are really important today and you hear a lot about. In addition, kids love to build things and they want to take classes that include this type of learning. So a lot of teachers also ask, who don't normally interact with this type of education. What is STEM? What is STEAM? So here's the basic definition for you. STEM or STEAM, as it's called in some circles, is an educational movement of the past decade or so, although a little bit longer than that, which has been fueled by industry's need to hire qualified workers. Right now, as things stand, most industry is hiring its workers, a large percentage of them, from out of our country. So it stands for science, the S is science, studying the world around us. T is for technology, or using the tools to learn and work. Uh, e is for engineering, designing and building things. Art, the A is for art, making things attractive and engaging. And the M is for math, measuring things and getting results. So why STEM? Why is all this emphasis on STEM? So the movement was fueled by industry, as I've said before, and the need for qualified people to fill jobs in industry. But it's not just about the actual things that STEM stands for. It is also about the skills involved in being successful in a STEM career. These are often called in the industry soft skills, and they're listed here uh, for you. They're often cited by industry employers as being really necessary for those who want to be successful in the field. And they are decision-making, problem-solving, adaptability, communication, collaboration, creative thinking, and critical thinking. So I bet as a language teacher, you can probably see some connections to things that you already teach in your class as a language instructor. I sure see a lot of connections. Many teachers always ask me, why connect classics to STEM? And as a humanities teacher, you may be asking this question or others. Do we as classicists expect every student we teach to become Latin teachers? And that's my question to you. Um, I think many of us would say, no, of course not. So then connecting classics to STEM subjects and interests draws students who may be taking other languages 
but are interested in learning more about the ancient classical world. Why should we exclude those students? And number two, should only Latin students be able to study classics? Um, I, my answer is, I don't think so. Uh, just because a kid thinks that Spanish is the better route for their life, that kid should, I think, have a chance to study about the ancient classical world in a rich and substantial way. I'll tell you a quick story. I had a student come in to me this past year in sixth grade named Javion, and I asked him, he's in every one of my, my classes, he's in my Myth Makers class and my Roman Tech class, and I asked him one day, because he's very smart, why he wasn't taking Latin that, you know, he and I got along really well. Did he not want to take Latin? And his answer to me was very measured. And he said, Ms. Roy, I love your classes. I love you as a teacher, but I feel like I want to be a doctor. And in my community where I live and in the state of Louisiana, where we live, um, our Hispanic pop population is growing. And he said, I feel it's important for me to learn to speak Spanish so that I can interact with um, my neighbors and my friends, but also because I feel like that is gonna be an important skill later in life when I become a doctor. And I feel like I can't argue with that reasoning. It's a very good answer to why he was not taking Latin. But if these classes were not being offered as electives for him to take, he would know very little about the ancient classical world. He would not have had this opportunity without these classes. So the classes I teach are meant to meet the needs of students who can't or don't take Latin for whatever reason. So the maker movement is um, also an educational movement that has been in the works now for about the past two decades. Um, their, their mantra is kind of everyone is a maker. It was founded by an early web developer named Dale Doggerty, and you can kind of look him up on your own, but he is, um, has been very influential in founding this and really funding it um, and getting it on going. He is uh, an interesting character. His book is listed here for you. It's called Free to Make, and it's really interesting. The movement itself and the community which has evolved around it kind of celebrates tinkering making things for the betterment of the world. And it's closely connected to STEM. So you've probably heard of this associated with maybe robotics, coding, 3D printing, and other digital designing programs. But it's not limited to those technologies. For example, lots of people who belong to the maker movement are people that you might meet at the Society for, Creat for Creative Anachronism or reenactors. They also celebrate making, but on a very, a more basic level. So maker fairs you may have heard of as well are kind of annual events that happen in a lot of cities. My city of Baton Rouge personally has one um, every year and it's held at the main library. And it's just a big fun kind of fair where people come to different booths, the maker set up at the booths and you can just visit the booth to make something along with them or to watch them make something. And these have these fairs have all kinds of people that come to them from you know, fancy robotics coding type people uh, to more basic design people like the reenactors who make chain mail and um, who weave. Um, my Roman technology students uh, attend every year. We lead people in making little mini containers of concrete, the ancient Roman way that they can take home. But it shows them the process of how we make and right, how the Romans made in ancient times. It also helps to promote our program. So the maker mantra, and this is from Dale Dougherty's book, Free to Make. Uh, he says, the maker movement signals a societal, cultural, and technological transformation that invites us to participate as producers, not just consumers. It is changing how we learn, work, and innovate. It is open and collaborative creative and inventive, hands-on and playful. We don't have to conform to the present reality or accept the status quo. We can imagine a better future and realize that we are free to make it. Making is the mother of all possible futures. And if you look at the graphic over here, you see that the maker education is founded on constructivist philosophy. I'm not gonna get into that here today, but 
some of the things associated with maker learning or making in the classroom are hands-on learning, student-centered, teacher as a guide, project-based, and discovery. I don't know about you, but these are all things that I really love to bring into my classes as much as I can. And I feel like making uh, is a great, uh, a great way to do that. Before we get into some of the projects that uh, I'll take you through today, I also thought I should mention the engineering design process. When working with STEM challenges or maker projects, we usually like to bring in the idea of the engineering design process. It's not as complicated as you might think. Just because you aren't a STEM teacher or a science or math teacher doesn't mean that you can't do this with your students because really it's quite simple. So any maker project can be set up in these terms. So I'm just gonna go through those with you. Number one, ask, define a problem. Number two, imagine, generate ideas. Number three is plan, select a solution that number four, you're going to create by making the item. Number five is the funnest part, that's the test. You evaluate the item by testing it to see if it works. And then number six is to improve it and try again with uh, recreating it if need be and then retesting it. And then last but not least, sharing or presenting the results. Obviously, number eight is kind of if you have time, you can recreate, retest, improve as needed. So before we talk about the projects that we're going to use the design engineering design process with, I wanted to talk about two makers that to me are kind of um, inspirational when we talk about Greek mythology. The first is, of course, Hephaestus. Um, the story of Hephaestus as the maker or blacksmith for the gods is a wonderful inspiration for making in the mythology classroom. So some things that he made that you may remember, um, the lightning bolts of Zeus, the thrones of the gods on Mount Olympus, a necklace for his wife Aphrodite or to entice him to entice her to be his wife. And then my favorite story, the robots that were supposed to assist him in his workshop. I won't mention the net that he created to catch his wife in her affair. So it's not sometimes a story that we can discuss with middle school students, but it is also something that is very famous that uh, Hephaestus made. Uh, we love to talk about Hephaestus. He's one of my favorite gods for this reason. Uh, and I love this, um, this vase with him on it in this picture. Next, of course, and I think this uh, maker is probably the one most mythology teachers think of when we talk about making, and that, of course, is Daedalus. And a good question to discuss with your students is, you know, was Daedalus a good maker? Uh, good questions to pose to students about the moral obligations of making. So, for example, his jealousy of his nephew Paradix um, and his eventual, well, his attempted murder of Paradix. Everyone loves the cow suit for Pasiphae, <laughs> the wife of Minos. Again, a story that's kind of something we're not, not the best to talk about with middle school students. The maze for the Minotaur, his most famous probably or possibly the wings for his son, Icarus. According to Pliny the Elder, uh, he said that he was the kind of father of carpentry and had created carpentry tools. So he had kind of, um, his story had kind of grown then with the Romans as time went on. So these are two great makers that you can discuss with your students before starting maker projects. So some suggestions on how to devise projects. I'm going to talk about three today, but we do many more and I'm trying to inspire you to also make with your students. So here's the process that might be helpful for you. Number one, pick a story from mythology. Just pick one, pick your favorite story. Focus on an aspect of that story that you think would interest your students. And then Google that idea with STEM challenge or maker challenge, and something will probably come up, believe it or not. If your school has a 3D printer, you might ask for someone to assist you with that. If your school has an inst a science instigator or a STEM assistant, they could probably help you. Teachers Pay Teachers has some really good STEM maker projects to look up. 
So you might even consider just starting there. Look through some of the projects that are available and then think backwards. How could I relate this to a classical myth? I'll just say a little something about supplies because often when people hear STEM and making, they think expensive. And I will tell you, 3D printing is expensive. However, um, there are some ways to do making that are really cheap. And I'm going to start with a really helpful um, maker and website. It's Arvind Gupta Toys. Arvind Gupta is an Indian maker, and he does an entire he has an entire website devoted to making toys out of literal trash. And this is a great place to start, also to get really good ideas. So go there. The projects I'm going to highlight today are in this presentation, we'll utilize only the simplest and cheapest things because I want you to start small and start cheap. My number one go-to maker um, is maker um, material is going to be cardboard. I'm a Girl Scout leader, so I have Girl Scout cookie cardboard every year in great supply <laughs> and it makes it very easy for us to have. But if you don't have that resource, everyone seems to have cardboard ordering from Amazon, ordering online, all kinds of things come in cardboard. I would recommend asking families to save it for you. Also asking your colleagues to save it for you because it can be used in really so many projects. It's also easy to store. So the first project I wanted to uh, talk about today is cardboard mazes. After, um, well, the basic challenge is that students working in pairs, I, I don't like them to work too much bigger than that because this is some really detailed work that they get into and a lot of times a third person kind of gets lost in the process. So working in pairs they create a maze for a small pet, uh, a mouse, a dwarf rat, a hamster, you pick. After reading the story of Daedalus's famous maze, the students design their own maze and build it from recycled cardboard. They research animal behavior, and pet care first. So that's part of the project, part of the challenge. And then they watch videos of similar projects to kind of research it and give them some ideas. Supplies that you will need are pretty simple. Cardboard, lots of it. Here's the stack of cardboard from my classroom when this project was finished. You're gonna need glue guns and glue sticks, which can get expensive, but also can be borrowed. So consider that. You're going to need scissors that cut cardboard easily. They actually make scissors specifically for this purpose. So I recommend that you look for that if you're planning to make an investment in this. If you're using lots of glue guns or you have a big class, lots of glue guns, you're going to need extension cords. So make sure you have those. Um, markers and paint and of course colored paper, anything that they can use to decorate their mazes. You'll also need for this one some space for storing the projects as they are being worked on. If you don't have that, it's going to be difficult for them to carry cardboard out of the classroom. That just doesn't work. You also want to consider if you have a colleague or a friend who has a pet that would be willing to be the um, <laughs> guinea pig, <laughs> although a guinea pig would probably be too big um, for this project. This pet will have to get to know your students have to visit and see if, you know, this pet could be used for this project. So unfortunately, I don't have some finalized results to show you on this project because we were two days really into the project when the quarantine began this past spring. Uh, but I can tell you my kids were really, really enjoying this and having a great, great time. Um, creating their mazes. This is a little detail from one that I saw as I was having to recycle this when I went in to clean up my classroom. And you can see the maker uh, who did this decided that she wanted to have a minotaur mouse in her maze. And I thought that was really, really cute. It was clear that she got the, um, she really was thinking about the story and making her maze more mythy, as we call it. So the next project that we have worked on numerous times in my classes is cardboard looms. And you'll see here in the picture, my student is holding one that he created and that he is weaving on uh, in the picture. 
So the students create and weave on simple cardboard looms. These are really easy to make. It is literally just a piece of cardboard. There are two cardboard pieces that you see here and here, which kind of lift the yarn and make it easier to uh, thread the yarn through back and forth. And so obviously this is connected to the story of Arachne and her contest with Athena. And the students, as I said, build this simple loom and they weave, they design whatever they want on it. It's quite simple really once you've done it. And it does give them a really good idea of what it was like to weave. Before they do this, of course, they research ancient Mediterranean drop weight looms, the ones that the ancient Greeks and Romans would have used. They watch videos about the development of looms through the ages, which is quite interesting. For this one, again, you'll need a cardboard flat piece for each student, some liquid glue, scissors, yarn, a plastic uh, needle for each student to use. You can see that here in the picture, Rosalind's using it. And then a plastic fork to serve as your comb when you are weaving. This helps to keep your, your uh, weft flat and even as you weave. You can see Rosalind's got quite far here in her present, in her, uh, in her loom. Uh, once the looms are created and the weaving begins, it, you should expect slow progress and some frustration at the progress. It is a really slow process and students, it really gives them an idea of what it must have been like to weave an entire garment, you know, out, out of yarn. It's just, it's an amazing process, but it's very slow. So just have some music and readings planned while the students are, are busy weaving. At some point I had to say, all right, y'all, no more weaving. <laughs> it is time to move on to our next story. And some students decided to leave their looms in my classroom to just kind of weave whenever they got a chance. Just kind of neat. All right, so this uh, project, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail for you so that you can see what it was, um, the design process that we used for it. So it's cardboard boats. And we connected this, of course, to Jason and the Argonauts, although I could say you could easily connect it to Odysseus as well. And in case you don't recall the Argo, uh, Jason's boat was a vital part of his story. It's masthead imbued with magical powers to advise him. And it also ended up killing him later in life when in a decayed state, because he didn't use his uh, ship anymore, it fell on him, killing him as he was sitting there in a drunken stupor. Not the best ending to the story. Uh, there's also plenty of archeological evidence about ancient Mediterranean ships to explore because let's face it, what a student or teacher doesn't like reading about sunken treasure, sunken ships, and what they hold for us to learn. So step one in the engineering design process is to ask or define the problem. So the students had to, the problem was the students had to make a cardboard boat that would hold a half pound weight because I like to tell them that the golden fleece was heavy. Um, this was related, or so we said, to the end of the story, or almost the end of the story of Jason and the Argonauts when he is fleeing the city of Colchis. He has Medea with him, and they have the Golden Fleece, and they are trying to get away from her father and his, um, his people that are trying to chase them down. Um, they are also going to have to win a race powered by their own breath. Okay, so they can only blow on the ship that is the only way that it can be propelled. It could be no longer, wider, or higher than 12 inches. So that was the limits. Uh, oftentimes in the engineering design process, you want to limit things to define a problem. Uh, and the, we talk about this all the time. This is a real life kind of situation in the engineering, the STEM world, right? Um, you're given a certain uh, length, width, height, money that you can spend on to solve a problem. So they have to have this in class too as part of their process. And then step two is to imagine. So this is the uh, part where they generate ideas. And I tried to get my students to work in, pair, in pairs or maybe threes. I'm not sure, I don't remember. I think it was two or three. 
Uh, they first watched a video about the famous Greek replica. It's called the Olympias. If you don't know about this ship, it's pretty awesome. You should go watch a few videos on it. Um, it is an actual Athenian trireme replica. It belongs to the Hellenic Navy, and they keep it in in the harbor at Nauplion. Uh, they also spent time researching just ancient Greek ships in general to give them an idea of what uh, that type of ship would have looked like and how it would have functioned. Step three in the design process is to plan to make a decision on a solution. So the students had to think about how to use their materials wisely because they were limited. They only had one Girl Scout cookie box that they could use to cut up and um, create their ship from. And as they built a small boat that would not sink, they also had to think about that. They also had to think about um, making it not absorb water too quickly. They had to think about speed, buoyancy, they were also tasked with adding mythy details, as we call them, from the story of the Argo. And they also had to use, obviously, a lot of soft skills, because when you're working in a group, communication, um, collaboration, all those things are very important. So then they had to create their item, their, their ship. Here's an example that you see here. They were trying to add mythy details here with the eye. And I forget what this boat was called. Um, I think this was a Latin student probably that, that did this one. But you can see they also had uh, packing tape to use that they could use if they wished to coat the outer part of the boat, of the cardboard, to make it absorb less water. They also had, they were also limited in time. They only had an one class and a half to create their ship. And that was uh, an hour and a half, so they had two hours total to make this happen. All right, so design process step number five. Uh, the students had to race their boats across a small swimming pool, which honestly I wish had been bigger, but it just wasn't. Uh, we had, we had, it was probably the funniest moment of my teaching career, yes. It was just hilarious. If I, if I can get the video out for y'all at the end of the presentation, I'll show it to you. Uh, you can see their boat here was a kind of a catamaran design, which I was very skeptical of, and I was right to be. It, it kind of sunk <laughs> when they when they tried it. But hey, it was their design. This is what's wonderful about maker learning. They, you know, they researched, they made the plan, they made the decision about how they were going to make it work, and the fact that it didn't work. Uh, they just went back and did it better the next time. All right, and then in step six, of course, is to improve. And you can see here, this is the sinking of <laughs> the ship that they created. The catamaran did not work. They quickly learned this when they put it in the water, but oh well. Uh, they, of course, were allowed to make another one and try their race again, so it was not the end of the world. And then step seven, of course, was to share. They had to present their results. And the student groups explained why they thought their designs were the best and how they fixed them if they needed to. And so here was the swimming pool and the, they were each trying their boat out to see if it would work before we had the race. So in case you're wondering what assessment would look like, this is what we did. Um, Assessment is not so much related to the final product and its success, but more so the success of their process, how they worked well together with other students and use their soft skills. So what I did here was I made them actually fill this out themselves before they give it to me. Each group had to assess themselves on whether or not their boat floated, held weight, was fast enough to win the race, um, what mythical details they added in. But then I just took the soft skills that were listed in earlier in this presentation and put them here. And each of them had to, each group had to give an example of how they demonstrated that soft skill while they were working in their group and how successful they were at, um, at that soft skill. This was an area I put in for myself to give them feedback after they turned in um, their evaluation. 
So a lot of uh, teachers ask how I get funding for these classes, particularly the Roman technology class, which involves a lot more technology and, and tools and supplies. So you may not know, but many industries offer grants, a lot of grants for classrooms, which incorporate STEM or STEAM concepts into the class. Uh, I've been able to earn over $10,000 for various projects in Roman technology and myth maker classes over the past two years. And my principal even would like to, our school to add a maker space to the school. That's a whole other thing that um, we may eventually do, but it's also a lot of work. So that's something to think about. Uh, if your school has a maker space already, you know, this would be a perfect opportunity for you to utilize it um, with your class. The opportunities are endless and everyone should consider this way of thinking for their own classrooms. There really, I think, is a great opportunity for us as classicists to, um, to make us uh, work with our field. And so I wanted to do a little bit about equity today. Um, I am recording this um, only a few days after the death of George Floyd. And it is uh, something that is always on my mind, but particularly this week. So I thought I would talk a little bit about my classes and how equity functions in them. Um, I truly believe that all classical educators right now need to be focused on this issue. Uh, it is not going away, and it is something that should be at the foundation of everything that we do. So I'll tell you a little bit about my school. Um, we are unique in that we house three different educational programs in one facility. We have a gifted and talented program. We have a program called Great Scholars or Scholars Academy. This is our district's uh, way of trying to bring up kids who are economically disadvantaged, but show talent, uh, academic talent into the gifted and talented program. Uh, and then we have our traditional program who, these are the kids who um, are just com coming from very economically disadvantaged families. Uh, we're in Baton Rouge, so that is really most, a lot of, almost all of our kids at the school. So um, I also believe strongly that we all need to be looking very carefully at the numbers in our, in our classes. And I'm going to share mine with you here. Uh, first of all, let's look at the whole school. So our whole school has, we have 529 kids in our middle school. 56% um, of those are African-American, 14% Asian, 14% Latinx, and 15% white. So we are a heavily minority school. Most of our kids are minority. So when you look at my classes, my Latin classes um, only have 12% African-American kids in them, and Asian and white about the same. But when you look at my Roman tech and my math, classical mythology classes, I've got, first of all, a lot more students in them. My Roman tech classes, there are two. I have um, about, I limit them at 20 kids per class because in that class we do use actual tools and I can only watch so many kids at a time. So we want to keep it safe. But my mythology classes are very large. I've got 24 kids in each, and they're constantly trying to put more kids in them because it is a very popular class. In those classes, you can see that um, my African-American population in particular is much higher than my Latin classes. Uh, my Asian population is, well, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. My Latinx kids, I actually have some, and my white kids are fewer. So I think that there is still work to do for me, um, but I'm making, I'm, I'm there for that. I want that to happen uh, because here's what I think. Um, language skills often divide students uh, at my school. Traditional students can, are not allowed to take a second language or world language because their standardized uh, test scores are so low that they are put into what we call double English classes. One class that focuses on reading and another that focuses on grammar. So they're not in the track that allows them to take that world language class. The classes that I teach are my way of trying to get around that. And I'm, I'm doing a good job right now, but I'm really hoping to pump that up. 
But the way I feel is that language skills often divide students. Um, tools, however, are great equalizers. 99% of kids have no idea how to use a hammer or any other tool, and they really like to learn how to. Uh, they all want to try. They're not scared to try. They're not afraid to speak up. They're not afraid to get into a group and try this activity. Whereas in my Latin classes, I see a very, very different situation. So clearly, as I said, I, I have work to do, but I'm committed to being at a school where minority students are the majority, and I will continue to promote my programs to them. Um, of particular interest, my principals are uh, very open to ideas about how to reach out to the Latinx community in particular. In Louisiana, we've had a large influx of Latinx people uh, after Hurricane Katrina a decade ago. And uh, I see a lot of those students, but unfortunately, I don't see them in my Latin classes. And I'm going to try harder to bring them into my Roman Tech and um, classical mythology class, my myth maker class. So um, if you are looking for resources about what I have discussed today, I'm going to go through a few of these with you. There's an awesome TED Ed video about the maker movement here that you can go and watch that features Dale Dougherty, the founder of the movement. I highly recommend going to a maker fair event in your city. Of course, in the next year, I'm not sure how many of those will actually happen due to the pandemic. But if you get to go to one, definitely um, just wander around and uh, enjoy the, the spirit of, of the movement. You can read about the maker uh, movement here in education in an article by ISTE. And then there is a wonderful book, which I've already talked about, called Free to Make, How the Maker Movement is Changing Our Schools, Our Jobs, and Our Minds by Dale Dougherty. I highly recommend it. And then if you want to learn more about uh, my Roman Tech program, you can read the article that was published by the Classical Outlook last fall about that, because there's lots of information about how to use STEM in um, the Latin classroom. So once again, um, I'm Natalie Roy, and it was very nice uh, to meet you today. I hope that you enjoyed the presentation. Feel free to email me with any questions or comments that you have. I'd love to hear from you. And go.